Good afternoon. I am Jenny. I'm deaf with speech. I'm the mother of a glorious 20-year-old son called Jonah. My mum did say I could do whatever I want, but my careers officer said, Jenny, you're deaf. You should be a librarian. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm the artistic director of Grey Eyes Theatre Company. It is the best job in the world. I've got a cracking team back in the office and I work with the most extraordinary cohort of deaf and disabled artists and we put them centre stage. I love my job. What I'm going to do this afternoon is just a few sound bites and some personal stories about me and some of my deaf and disabled artists about what it's like working in this current climate. Behind me in a minute, there will be a film show showing. This group of people were my 44 deaf and disabled trainees. We train them up through the Paralympics to be centre stage in that stadium. This lot and me are dependent on two governmental schemes to support us, Access to Work and Independent Living Fund. Access to Work is the government best secret. It was, it is, and I hope it will continue to be, the most fantastic scheme which enables me and other deaf people and other disabled people to enter the workforce as full and equal to full, full, sorry, to fulfil, full, full, fill, <laughs> why do I use words, a full, fill our role with equality. For me, it means I can have the glorious Steve and Jenny, who you've all been watching today. It means I can access TED Talks. When the deaf and disabled people are working, they come off benefits. There are about 37,000 people who use access to work. So we are off benefits, we're working, we pay our taxes. And in turn, we also employ sign language interpreters, support workers, and all the rest of it. And in turn, they pay their taxes. Steve, Jen, do you pay your taxes? <laughs> Thank God for that. So that's access to work. The Independent Living Fund is exactly what it stands for. It's a fund to allow disabled people to live independent, independently and to be able to use and choose their support worker. But in December 2012, Esther McVeigh, who was the, the Understate Secretary for Disabled People, announced just out of the blue that the Independent Living Fund was going to close. It's going to close in June 2015, six weeks away. And it is now going to be managed by the local authorities. Well, we all know that local authorities are being cut to smithers. So how are they going to absorb the cost of this? I really do not know. The pot for Independent Living Fund is 320 million. And a weekly package is in around £346 a week per person. That compared very favourably with how much it costs for one person per week in a residential care home. That costs us £3,500 a week. £346 per week, £3,500 a week. We could all do the maths, can't we? It's a very young fund, actually. Only 8.7% of people who use this are over the age of 65. The closure of this fund is breaching human rights. Article number 19, a right to independent living. Article 28, the right for an adequate standard of living and protection. When Bradley Hemmings and I were starting to do our work on the Paralympic ceremony, of course we went to Stephen Hawking. And Professor Stephen Hawking gave us our very first quote. I love it, and I use it a lot. Don't look down at your toes. Look up at the stars. Be curious. Well, I am. I am very curious to know why deaf and disabled people are considered second-class citizens, why we are ghettoized, discrimination, discriminated and deemed worthless. Can you just think, for one single moment, 
If Stephen Hawking had been told that they couldn't meet his access costs, that because of his physicality, his disability, that he should not be allowed to be a scientist, we would know about black holes or Hawking's radiation. We would not know about our cosmic universe. If Beethoven had stopped composing when he became deaf, we would not have the Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy. Roosevelt, if he hadn't been able to stand for president, and he, because of his paralysis, he would not have got America out of the Depression, and millions would not have benefited from his New Deal scheme. And Frida Kahlo, can we imagine not having the artwork of Frida Kahlo? Now, we have so much to put in to the fabric of civilization. I've been battling personally with access to work for the last 18 months. My first letter was, Dear Jenny, your hours of sign language provision is 35 hours per week. We are changing that now to 72 hours per month. Also, you are not allowed to lose fully qualified level six sign language interpreters because your work is not deemed jargon based enough. Excuse me, I only work with level six. <laughs> Dear Mr. S, yes, we know you have a mobility impairment, but can't you get a friend to help? Dear Mr. K, your ILF has been cut. Dear Miss G, your lip speaking patterns of 23 hours a week are now going to be 23 hours a year. Hello, is this access to work? This is Grey Eyes Access Coordinator speaking, wanting to know about the BSL provision for some of our deaf actors. Hello, yes, this is access to work. What's BSL? <laughs> I mean, hello. In this country, there's 1,900 interpreters. Uh, that includes training interpreters. But 48% of them are thinking of quitting because the deaf person cannot guarantee that they will get their access supports covered. So we're going to become like Thailand, where there are only 20 interpreters across the whole country. Thailand and other countries, because of cultural beliefs, think that deaf and disabled people did something very evil, something bad, something sinful in a past life. And that's why we've been born into this life, disabled. And you may remember, some of you, that our very own England man manager, Glenn Hoddle, had that same philosophy. I do find it sad that my global network with my deaf and disabled community is founded upon a shared experience of being discriminated against, ghettoised and sidelined. We have to have skin so thick to put up with the crass attitudes and crass comments. A Bangladeshi activist, blind, was doing some white cane training in the government building in Bangla. He arrives, the government people give him money, they think he's a beggar because he's blind. And in Africa, so much work has been done for those families who give birth to a disabled baby, for that baby not to be deemed a shame or an embarrassment, for that baby to be that glorious bundle, bundle of joy that it is. And here, last year, Greya did a co-production of the Threepenny Opera, and an audience member was very shocked thought that all the actors busking, deaf and disabled actors busking outside the, the foyer in the show were real buskers, not that they would be actors in the show. So her bottom nearly fell out when she saw them on the stage. She's like, oh my God, stage management, those disabled people are on the stage. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> Dear Jenny, I'm M. This is what my care package will now look like if it's only social services with no support from the Independent Living Fund. I will be able to have Overnight, every night, a support worker who will put me to bed and wake me up in the morning. At lunchtime, someone else will come in, give me my lunch and a cup of tea, and in the evening come and give me my dinner. That's every day. Per week, I will have support for seven hours of social activity, 90 minutes for shopping, 45 minutes for ironing, I get that one. And I will have two 15-minute slots for a full body shower. On a daily basis, between nine and midday, 
I will have no access to go to the bathroom as and when I need to go to the bathroom. So some, when someone arrives at 12, I will be wet. So most of their time will be taken bathing me and changing me. So I'll only have time for a sandwich. And then the same will be in the evening. I will be wet, I will need to be changed, and then it'll be a microwave meal because there's no more time left for cooking. That will be my life. I need the independence to go to the bathroom when I want to go to the bathroom. My friend, an actress I work with, who's been campaigning and fighting for the survival of the RLF, when I said to her, Sophie, you've been in residential school all your life, you don't want to go back to a residential care home, do you? She said, Jen, Jen, this is not on my radar. Jen, it can't be. We've been fighting for 30 odd years. No, no, it's not going to happen. It can't happen. Dear Jenny, I'm a deaf graduate. I've just got a first in business and international studies, and I've just had my first job. And access to work gave me six hours a day, five days a week, so I could do my job. I've just got a brand new job. I reapplied to access to work. They've given me three hours a week. I've lost my job. And for every deaf person that loses their job, so does a sign language interpreter or two sign language interpreters. So the unemployment statistics are getting two for the price of one. Also, this one. Dear Jenny, access to work, don't think it's relevant for me to have access. Dear Miss M, we don't think you need access. Yes, you have a brain injury and a mental health problem, but you're aware of it. Also, another one. This is actually the RNIB. My blind friend phones up. Hello, RNIB. My dog had a cone because he's had an ear operation. He's managed to get the cone off and he's been scratching his ear. I think there's blood everywhere. What do I do? Help. Oh dear, that sounds awful. Um, well, there's a number on his collar. <laughs> How do I access that number? I'm blind. And the framework, the government framework at the moment for access for deaf, blind people is that they can use sign language interpreters yeah. on a screen. Deaf, blind sign language is just tactile language. How you are tactile with a video screen, God only knows. I'm very curious about all of this. I'm curious about how do they make these decisions to make all these cuts? How? I'm also curious about how, why people think they can say what they do to us. Uh, with that arm, one of the artists that was in that picture with a short arm, with that arm, darling, we'd never have you on our stage. Jenny, Lorca did not write Blood Wedding for people like you to be in it. Well, I'm sorry, when someone says no, I do it. So, we do have a production of Lorca's Blood Wedding on the Everyman, and it's on tonight, and the last night is tomorrow. Dear Jenny, don't you have your own stages to go to? Yes, we do. The Everyman in Liverpool. Dear Jenny, don't you see that people, it's much more palatable when non-disabled people play disabled characters. <laughs> and this is my bugbear, which I've talked about a lot since 2012. My glorious para-athletes, para-performers, the athletes, everything that's about the Paralympics was just glorious. And I really thought that a phone would be ringing off the hook, and it did. Channel 4 phoned and said, well, I didn't do that. They had to be emailing me in. But they said, dear Jenny, the Paralympics was fantastic. Please could you um, put forward some of your deaf, disabled, professionals and volunteer cards for our very empowering programme, The Undateables. Have you seen it? It's car crash television. It's sick, disgusting, and I'm hell-bent on getting that eradicated. And I'd like you to join me on that. The other thing is, at the moment, Mark Harper has put a cap on... He's a minister for disabled people. He's put a cap on access. So for me, I'm only going to be able to do about 60% of my job with full and equal access. I don't know how to run a theatre company, be the chief executive of Grey Eye, be the artistic director of Grey Eye, with only 6% of support. So I suppose because I'm running out of time now, 
I ask all of you, you will have deaf friends and family and colleagues, please make yourself familiar with all the issues in and around Access to Work and the Independent Living Fund and join our campaign to try and overturn these crass things because I'm sorry, I have got a lot to give to society and so have all of my luck and I'm damned if we are going to be sidelined. Thank you. Thank you.